and finally figured out what my job was. And my job was to make these little pancakes and have them right and have them what they want and deliver them on time. And my customer's job was to make a decent order so we could understand it in a somewhat timely manner and uh, pay their bill. And I decided that uh, I didn't have any money so the board builders can buy a blank and and have it in the water in a week. And I didn't like a bunch of my foam that hadn't been paid for sitting out with a bunch of flaky surfers riding waves with it. So pretty simple business plan. Yeah. But what I really had to do is figure out what the shaper wanted and get it there to him right and in time and try and in time anticipate their need. Yeah. And that was my job. It's a real simple job. Yeah. Once, you, once you boil it down to that, and take all the uh, hoopla around it, it makes it pretty easy. Are you ready, boys? That's Gordon Clark. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine. The Journal delivers 136 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. If you want to learn more, if you'd like to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Gordon Grubby Clark is one of the innovators of the polyurethane blank and the founder of Clark Foam, which dominated the blank-making business from the early 1960s until its implosion in late 2005 when he suddenly closed up shop. It sent shockwaves through the surf world, and Gordon's always been reluctant to give interviews, so the rumor mills spun. I'm reading from the Encyclopedia of Surfing here. Quote, Clark was born in 1931 in Los Angeles, raised in Whittier, and learned to surf while attending Pomona College in the late 1940s and early 1950s, where he earned a BS in engineering. In 1955, after spending two years in the Army, Clark was working as a laminator for Hobie Surfboards, the soon-to-be world's largest board manufacturer. Clark began to develop polyurethane foam molds in the mid-50s, looking for a replacement material for balsa wood, which was costly and often hard to find. In 1958, Hobie surfboard switched entirely from balsa to foam. Clark made an amicable split from Hobie in 1961 to form Clark Foam in Laguna Canyon, later relocating to Laguna Niguel, and by the mid-1960s, Clark had become the runaway leader in blank production. He later attributed his success to the fact that nobody else wanted to do the job. There's nothing romantic about foam, he said in 1972. It's dirty, messy, and smelly, and nothing you dream of doing for a career. Surfer Magazine named Clark as the 10th most influential surfer of the 20th century. Before sitting down with Gordon, I told my friends that pretty much every surfboard I ever stepped on up until the year 2005, and this goes for most surfers in America, was Clark Foam. Gordon Clark is now 90 years old and lives on a 52,000-acre cattle ranch in Central Oregon. We spoke in his office with views over tractors and livestock. There's a cameo from TSJ co-founder Steve Pesman, who accompanied me on the trip. Gordon and Steve are lifelong friends and have a funny relationship. One morning, we were sitting in Gordon's dining room eating breakfast. See those birds, said Gordon, pointing out the window to a flock of birds in a tree? Those are buzzards. They're waiting for us. So, Gordon, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And Mrs. Pesman asked me to do this, and uh, so I'm doing it. I'm so glad that you are. Um, maybe if you could sort of bring us up to um, Clark Foam. You know, you started surfing. You found your way to Clark Foam. Okay, well, I was born in Los Angeles. My parents moved to Long Beach, Wilmington, Carson, and then at Eight years old, we moved to Gardena. So I really grew up in Gardena, California. I lived there till I was 18 years old. 
And at that point, I moved down to the Dana Point, San Clemente area when I wasn't going to school. And that's where I lived principally the most part of my life. About eight years old, my parents had some friends that bought a house in Palos Verdes, and we started going to the beach there in the summer quite a bit. I had a little plywood belly board and, of course, a blow-up surf mat, and that was my first experience to surfing. Uh, the first surfboard I ever really noticed was Rennie Yaters. I was going to college. I was going to the beach and playing volleyball down the Newport area, San Clemente, and I saw guys surfing, and it looked fun, and I bought a 90-pound surfboard and started surfing at San Onofre. And how old were you about then? About 18. Okay. And I was in college. I just started college. After two years of college, I was surfing so much, I uh, went to Hawaii. But meanwhile, my first surfboard, my second surfboard, uh, Hoyle Schweitzer, a fellow classmate and the guy that invented and patented windsurfing, was a fellow classmate of mine at Pomona College, and we built our first surfboards, balsa and fiberglass, and copies of Matt Kivlin's excellent work he was doing at Malibu. Mm -hmm. That was my first experience building a surfboard. And was that in the garage? or We were, well, we were in the college dorm, and it ruined all the tile, and the dorm <laughs> <laughs> kind of made a mess. But uh, then we started surfing a lot more, surfing trestle primarily. Okay. And this is what year exactly? More or less? Nin 1952. Yeah. Right around there. Okay. Um, I was going to get drafted. I found out there was a basic training in Hawaii. Hawaii was the mecca of surfing, as everyone knew then. I bought a one-way airplane ticket to Hawaii to go surfing. And while I was there, I got my first job in the surfboard industry. It was fascinating. It was for Tom Blake. Yeah. Tom was the inventor of the fin, probably the biggest single development in the history of surfing. He did that in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. He also developed the hollow surfboard. Yeah. Tom had a tremendous history. He was a great swimmer in the 1920s. He started, he started surfing in the mid-1920s. So as an interesting guy, and our, my job, he got a contract uh, by the old, there was a, a big surfboard rental place owned by a guy named Earl Akana. And Tom got a contract to take all their balsa rental boards or most of their balsa rental boards, strip the fiberglass off of them because they were all waterlogged because no one had patched them and kept surfing them. And also to glass the rails on some hollow paddle boards that Tom had built or had built under his design for rental boards. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. We worked in the old Steiner building in the basement was where everything was kept. And for sanding the boards, we plugged into the old merry-go-round bar right on Waikiki Beach in the sand. And I'm sanding fiberglass wow. on the beach in Waikiki, believe it or not. And uh, that was a several month long job, uh, very interesting. And during that time, I got to interrogate Tom about his whole history. And for some reason, I was very fascinated at an early age about materials. Yeah. And so I got his entire history of the paddleboard and, and the problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, one interesting thing that I learned from Tom that over the decades, and still to this day, is, is a mistake being made, but Tom figured it out in the 1930s. When you put a surfboard in the hot sun, it gets hot. Yeah. 
Uh, we measured the surface temperature at 160 degrees one time uh, at Hobie's with a little thermometer thing. And then you take the board and throw it in the cold water. It pulls a vacuum on it. So Tom learned this with his hollow paddle boards. He couldn't keep the water out of them. He mm -hmm. tried everything possible and he couldn't do it. And if you plugged them up solid, they would, the vacuum would collapse them. Mm -hmm. So, I've seen that before. This this is a problem that's gone on and on. It went through with the honeycomb wave board in the '60s and clear through the uh, oh that that um, the latest one, a big one was that surf tech board or those boards they make in uh, Thailand. Yeah, uh, with that technology and the inner core is not completely waterproof. And so they have the same problem. Yep. Balsa boards had that problem too. If you didn't fix a ding, you would suck up water. It's a very important part in surfboard construction that most people have missed, but I learned it from the inventor of the fin. <laughs> and you were paying close attention, you'd studied engineering in college. So you were- Well, I, at, at the time, so going back to the education, another interesting point, with materials during that same period, I met Bob Simmons. Mm -hmm. And this was the year before he died. And for some reason, this idiot 19 year old is asking the, you know, one of the pioneers of balsa fiberglass construction all about his foam experiments, which happened about 1948. Mm -hmm. That's when he started it and all the things he tried. Uh, Oh, with with epoxy and extruded polystyrene foam. That's where he's fooling with. He got some out of, the, as I heard later, out of the back door from either Douglas or Lockheed. When they first got a hold of it, they gave him some, mm -hmm. and he started fooling with it for surfboards. That was in 1948. Wow, ten years before the urethane board. Yeah, and so anyway, I met him. I got to see the exceptional work. It was Wally First, Forsyth, Woody Brown, and especially Georgie Downing, mm -hmm. who was probably the best surfer in the world for sure at that time. And they were trying to develop the first big wave boards. And George is an excellent board builder and craftsman. And so I got to see their work and watch you know, what they were doing, primarily at Makaha at the time. But that, that was also a fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. So when I got drafted, I spent two years in the Army, conned my way into all these night shift jobs and stuff, and I've never served so much in my life. Mm -hmm. And I was stationed for over a year right there at Helimano, right by the Haleiwa, right by the North Shore. Yep. And so I got a lot of surfing time in and I did not do too well in the army. I ended up as low as I could possibly be as in rank. Mm -hmm. I made private first class for three months and I was back to private again. Afterwards, I went back to college. I went to, my college was at Pomona College in Claremont, California. My major was primarily math and physics. I also took a great course in chemistry so, and all I had was a four-year degree when I graduated, but that was my background. And to any young people listening to this, they're interested in things like this. I never could have done what I did without that college education and that background. Yeah. Because I got just enough that I could read and study and understand scientific stuff fairly well. Yep. And without that, I could not have done what he did at Clark Foam and a lot of that other stuff. Right. So after the service, I got a job working for Hobie. And for the first summer, Rennie Yader and I split the glassing. Uh, he did half and I did half. Hobie and Rennie taught me to glass surfboards. And are you working a foam or, or wood at this no, point? No, this is balsa wood. Yeah, yeah. Hobie had the, the, the latest, greatest 
glassing technology in the surfboard industry at the time. An interesting point is he was helped by an old San Onofre surfer who's in the Plastics Hall of Fame, knighted in Europe and a bunch of other things, uh, named Brent Goldsworthy, who owned Thalco, or was a half owner in Thalco, who sold Bob Simmons and Pete Peterson the first fiberglass to use on surfboards. Hmm. Goldsworthy, was, Goldsworthy was also one of the pioneers in the uh, fiberglass boat industry. Okay. And he did the first fiberglass body for cor the Corvettes. Hmm. So he was hmm. one of the great pioneers and later uh, did um, Poltrusion and had his big company. Very famous guy in the plastics world. Okay. And he was the first person to try and use plastic in surfboards. In 1938, he tried to build an acrylic surfboard. These are all really little known facts, yeah. Jamie, that yeah. most people don't know a, a thing about and most surf riders have totally missed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, when Brad Goldsworthy passed away, Bert Rutan gave his eulogy. Bert Rutan was the first guy to fly an airplane around the world on one tank of gas and the first individual into outer space, a very famous aeronautical engineer. And he said in, in the eulogy that Brent Goldsworthy was smarter than the rest of us. Hmm. So that was one of Hobie's gurus that helped him with the fiberglass part of the thing. Uh -huh. So there was a tremendous amount of assistance at that period of time. Kind of an interesting side story that everyone kind of missed. Right. And, and at that time... So I, I met Brent Goldsworthy too because he'd come in the shop after surfing at San Onofre. Okay. There seemed to be a, I know the, about the aerospace industry and there was a sort of push for innovation there, but was there a big push for innovation in surfboard materials and technology and design? Well, I would say that at all times, surfboards have been hitting on the latest technology there is, clear, you know, through carbon fiber, yeah. all these different things. Yep. Well, so figure this out. 1946 was when Simmons and Peterson started making fiberglass on balsa. Mm -hmm. There wasn't even a fiberglass boat industry then. Yeah. So you can say the surfboards were ahead of the boats. Yeah, and, that's and, interesting. And, and almost in a sense, or right there at the very start. That was 1946. Mm -hmm. So there was barely a polyester around, you yeah. know, or fiberglass. Yeah. So you and Yader are working for Hobie, you're glassing surfboards and from there that was the well the first summer what happens i came back and had to go to college i had to pay for college so i had to work and my first summer i had two jobs one was splitting the glassing at hobie's and i also worked at an oil refinery in huntington beach as a, as a summer substitute and it was kind of a night shift day shift job. I learned a tremendous amount. I worked in what's called an absorption plant. It's mm -hmm. a refinery mm -hmm. and a fascinating job. Then during the next year, during vacations and holidays and stuff, I'd go down and, and glass too, uh, off and on. And when I graduated from college, I went to work full-time for Hobie. Okay for all the wrong reasons a young person does. I wanted to surf, I didn't want to get a regular job. Mm -hmm. And and glassing, I got it down to a little over a two day a week job and the rest of the time I could surf. Mm -hmm. That was in June of 1957. In January of 1958, it was kind of a funny story. Phil, and I, Phil Edwards and I had boiled Hobie's 14 foot boat and took a trip to the Channel Island to surf and dive. We're out there for 10 days. And during that period of time, came back and Hobie was one week into foam. Hmm. He'd just blown up his first mold. And so he needed a helper. He stopped making balsa boards, stopped everything and jumped hard into it. So in, in early January of 1958 is when he started in June 
believe it or not, we came out with a, with a foam board. Wow. And that was all Hobie's capital, Hobie's money. If you know anything about Hobie, when you're around Hobie, he's, he's a genius and he power attacks everything. He won't talk to anybody or do anything else. And so he really pushed the whole thing hard. And uh, we came out with a board and he was swamped with orders immediately. And was it an immediate kind of great leap forward in terms of performance and how a board well, would ride? I've seen uh, surfing tabloid reporters uh, hmm. say uh, foam, urethane foam was invented in 1958 and hasn't changed since. Uh, it, it's changed constantly and it's still being improved to this day. Mm -hmm. The first blanks were, were, had a lot of holes in them and flaws and problems and things like that. And everybody had that problem in the early foam thing. Uh, Dave Sweet had been working on foam for two years. And he started in 1956, I believe. Mm -hmm. And his brother was involved and a movie actor, Cliff Robinson, was financing some of the stuff. I don't know the exact details on mm -hmm. all of that, but the Sweet Brothers were involved, and Cliff Robinson was financing some stuff and this and that. But Dave was the principal guy that that figured it all out. Okay. And Dave's focus and Hobie's focus and everyone's focus at the time was to mold a surfboard. Mm -hmm. And eliminate the shaper and just have a, a molded part that you just glassed and sold. Mm -hmm. Well, an interesting point, Dave was successful and Hobie wasn't, and no one else was. Mm -hmm. And Dave never did very much. He had a small production and finally, finally quit, but he did a tremendous job and uh, it, it did the molded thing, something that's never really been copied to this day. And so it surprises me that more people haven't tried to, you know, go in that direction. Um, but anyway, that was the story. And, and Dave told me that he came out with his board commercially two weeks after Hobie. Oh, interesting. Now, there, was, there were several technical problems that Simmons should have figured out, but he didn't. And there were, there were two technical things. One was um, the center stringer. And what the center stringer does, which we didn't really figure out, Hobie put the center stringer in right away because mm -hmm. he figured out right away he had to shape the damn stuff. Yeah. And so he put a center stringer in so it'd hold it stiff enough to shape. Yeah. Well, when you glass it, the center stringer holds the two pieces of foam or the, the fiberglass on either side from bending. So for the board to bend, one side has to compress the fiberglass, the other side has to stretch. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps the board stiff. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big deal. So uh, – Dave Sweet didn't put a stringer in his boards, and they flexed. They fluffed. They were called flexi flyers, and they flexed all over the place. And they were not successful, really. Yep. Okay. The second thing was, is that being lazy in 1957 and didn't like to get the itch, the technology was that you would lay up a layer of glass, and then you would sand it. Hmm. Well, you got really itchy because you were sanding fiberglass. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're sanding the tops of the fibers off, so with balsa, it didn't really make that much difference because balsa was stiff on its own with the, the grain in the wood. With foam, it ruined your longitudinal strength mm -hmm. and the boards would break in half. Okay. So what you do is you lay it up and then you do what's called the hot coat or the fill coat next, which all boards are done that way now. But I was the one that started that because I didn't want to get itchy. Uh -huh. But I also figured out, hey, it's making the board stronger. Wow. And Hobie bitched about it when I first did it and didn't like it. And then, then all of a sudden he finally accepted it and, and explained it all and how it worked. And, and uh, that was made the Hobie board successful also. I see. 
Dave's boards. The first summer they flexed too much, and, uh, and most of them broke in half because mm -hmm. they had sanded through the glass. So anyway, but so Hobie was swamped with orders. It was immediately successful, and we couldn't make enough boards. It just it just took off like crazy and totally disrupted the existing industry. Mm -hmm. Going from the balsa to the foam, was it an immediate leap in performance? Were the guys in the water doing well, things that they hadn't done before? Uh, uh, no. The reason for the foam, kind of in a sense misunderstood. The original foam boards were as heavier or heavier than balsa wood. Okay. The foam was so weak that mm -hmm. they were making, mm -hmm. they had to use two layers of 10-ounce cloth and a deck patch to hold it together. I see. Balsa wood is a real pain in the rear to shape, to glue up and shape and match the wood and all that. It was a tremendous expense yeah. compared to foam. Foam, these guys that were starting out, they just buy a chunk of foam and they could shape it and glass it and sell it. And, and during the summer, it, it instantly sell. And so big deal, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they were throwing anything they could together to get it. There was a serious problem with balsa boards. That's back to the old Tom Blake theory. What's that? You get a ding in this balsa board, a small hole in the balsa board, get it hot in the sun and throw it in the water, it sucks up water. I see. So if you don't do anything about that, yeah. pretty soon your board's real heavy, and then it starts delaminating. So balsa boards were a maintenance problem. Any little ding or anything like that, you had to fix it right away, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. besides being hard to make. Yeah. So, and it was difficult to get a supply of balsa wood. So, but the, for, the, for the board owner, the maintenance factor was, was kind of a real pain in the rear. Yeah. Foam eliminated that. So you can ding up your board all you want to and keep riding it, right. it doesn't matter. Throw some duct tape on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see how you know guys do it. Anyway, so the shortage of balsa, the difficulty of balsa, all of that other stuff was a, a, a hindering factor, and that made foam, the lack of maintenance, the availability, and all of that. Yeah. That's what brought in right away. Well, right away... Uh, at Hobie's, we made uh, Mickey Dora and, and uh, Joey Cabell and a few of those guys, you know, a 20-pound longboard. Mm -hmm. Well, longboards were 30, 35 pounds mm -hmm. of, out of balsa. You know, you, you couldn't get them down that light. Yeah. So we made them some boards that were lighter for real good surfers. But with the foam we had and everything, it, it you know, that was just kind of an experimental thing that I happened see. on it. But... To answer your question about the performance, yes, as the foam started improving, the weight of the board went down, mm -hmm. and then that definitely affected performance. And we saw more of the but the, the, origi the original stuff that was put out. It was it was a tragedy. I see. And what happened was is there was a, immediately developed a bunch of big manufacturers like Jacobs, Hobie. Weber, mm -hmm. Noel, yeah, and they were making these big, heavy boards, and then Jacobs and Velzi developed one of the ills of the surfboard industry, and that's giving away free surfboards hmm. and uh, buying, making crap and giving it away to sell it to people that don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And so, instead of copying. The work like Downing and those guys did in Hawaii, you saw the best surfers around trying to ride Sunset on these heavy, poorly shaped, poor designed boards. It was ugly. Yeah, it was really, it was really sad seeing them try and try and take these big, heavy, wide tail longboard things and and uh, try and try and ride a pretty heavy wave. Right. And remember, balsa wood was three and a quarter inches thick. Yeah. It took us a few years to figure out that, hey, we can make a mold that's thicker than three and a quarter inches or thinner than three and a quarter inches. 
We can do all these things with. So everything was just a copy of balsa wood for the first years. And, and they were, they were, all the shapes were what we were shaping in balsa wood. There was, you know, no real difference in that. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have, you know, I only had, when I started, I only had four molds. And I think Holby had, I can't remember how many he had, but mm -hmm. less, and there were very few molds around. Yep. Were you shaping too at this time or just concerned with the technology? I, I shaped my own boards fooling around, but I'm not a, it was never a shaper. I've, I've made boards, but I've never. But you were right, you were kind of ear to the I, ground I was, with everything. I was a, I was a, a glasser. Yeah. Because uh, there's less ego and more money, <laughs> <laughs> but you were sort of taking in. You, obviously, all your all you were in a, your peer group were shapers, so you were taking in their uh, their. Oh feedback yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I was yeah. I was around. Yeah. You know, I was around all the the name great names you read of that period. You yeah. Know? And so very soon after this, you found your way. You I, I, met, I met I uh, met Greg Knoll when he was 17 years old. I used to surf trust all the time with Dewey Weber. Wow. One of my best friends, I met him when he was 13 years old, was Phil Edwards, who was head and shoulders above everybody then. Mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone in surfing that I know of has gotten that much better than everybody else than Phil did for a short period of time. So so early foam, and we're right in 1959, we're getting right to the beginning of Clark Foam. Okay, you well, during that period of time, I also, between... Graduating from college in Clark Foam, I spent over a year in bed from back problems. Yes, you mentioned this. And so I finally got two spinal fusions, and I was I was in a body cast from my crotch to my armpit for six months. Wow. And laid up, and that was an interesting period because I learned, I, after about three months, I almost went nuts, and then I started, well, I'll study things, and I did, and I, and I, I learned how to do accounting and some business management stuff because I saw the problems Hobie was having running his business and his accounting thing. And so I helped Hobie set up a bookkeeping system and things like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in 1961, the molding technology that Sweet and uh, Harold Walker, especially, had developed and made everything Hobie had obsolete. Mm -hmm. So Hobie. And by then it was, several things were obvious. By then it was obvious that it was going to cost a bunch of money to set up a blank factory. And you really couldn't afford one for a single shop. Mm -hmm. you, had to, you had to have more customers than one. And Hobie was the biggest surfboard manufacturer by far than in numbers, but he still couldn't afford it all by himself. So... We split off, and in January of 1961, I took over his old foam shop, and all I got, he even took the glue press, all I got was a few racks and some resin handling equipment that was real crude, and started Clark Foam. Okay. So that was January of 1961, that's when it started. Mm -hmm. So what was it like when you first started? Who was using Clark Foam at that period? Uh, Hobie, mm -hmm. Rennie Ader. Con Colburn, Con Surfboards, Warty Surfboards, a few others. Mm -hmm. They started buying from me right away because they knew me and they had confidence that I could come through eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so you're so you're making foam. These are early stages of foam. Had you... had four molds in the in the factory in Laguna Canyon. Mm -hmm. It was right across from Laguna Festival of Arts. Okay. An old building know, there. Yep, I know that exact area. And uh, that was the factory there. And then in 1963, I purchased 2.2 .2 acres in Laguna Niguel. Mm -hmm. I was the second building to go up in that that portion of Laguna Niguel. There was nothing around me but farmland when I moved in there. Well, it's so densely uh, developed. Yeah. yeah, I know that now area. Now it's a megatropolis or something. Yeah. So anyway... Uh, Started Clark Foam then. As I said, it only had four molds, and only two of them were popular. We had a lot of temperature problems and things. I'd have to get up at 3 in the morning, and during the middle of the day in the summer, I couldn't foam. And in the winter, I was doing everything I could to warm the place up enough to make foam. And uh, 
couldn't sleep much or things like that. But originally, I would do the foaming and the gluing, and mm -hmm. didn't have many employees, mm -hmm. very few, and then gradually. But meanwhile, since they started, Walker and Foss both had big factories and were really going hard. I, okay. I had a little tiny factory. Yeah, and we were talking yesterday, and you were you were you described something really interesting, which was just sort of paying attention to the market marketplace and kind of just reading the uh, reading what the shapers needed, what the surfboard what the surfers were doing in the water, and kind of being a. We were talking about your success, and and you talked about sort of anticipating where where it was all going to go. Well, when the foam board came out, and especially the sweet technology, all these guys go, wow, we can mold a surfboard, and the market's growing, and we've got Gidget and the Beach Boys and all this other stuff. It's, it's, wow, we're going to... So people started pouring capital in, mm -hmm. and they were all making, which I think I was the one that came up with a word for pop-outs or molded boards yep or a different technology than the the at that time the the foam blank and the hand shaper and the wood center stringer and the glassing so there were all these companies starting uh chuck foss went very hard in that direction and uh then of course sweet and and that was that was the big goal so there was a battle with the guys around that had been making balsa boards mm -hmm. and now had foam blanks and the new guys that started making foam boards because it was really easy for young punks to get in the in the blank i'm saying this because steve pesman sitting behind me and steve <laughs> pesman was one of the young punks that started making surfboards then Buying Foss foam, he never bought my foam, the jerk. Anyway, <laughs> I wouldn't have sold to him anyway. He was a punk. Uh, the uh, <laughs> Steve with middle finger raised. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there was all these different technologies and weak foam, strong foam, different foam, different things, and it was it was a mishmash of everything. And there was there was a seasonal problem. Also, which was kind of weird, people can't understand it today, wetsuit technology was horrible. Mm -hmm. There was almost none. So who wants to surf in California in January with no wetsuit? Yeah. So six months of the year, you had nothing to do. Six months of the year, you couldn't keep up. Well, I surfed a lot, and I'm going, hey, these boards are getting better. I was pretty enthused about the whole thing, mm -hmm. and I knew about the wetsuit thing, and I don't think a lot of other people did. And so I kept expanding and pushing in that direction. So I went for high-quality, custom, hand-shaped, fiberglass, that section of the market. I didn't fool around and, and you know waste my time trying to do anything else. I focus hard on that, and I focus very hard on improvement mm -hmm. wherever, wherever we could. Yeah, I was really yelling at everybody about their fiberglassing and and stuff like that to try and keep that keep the standards high. Yeah, on the board, and that's what we needed, and that's the way it went. And I was I was at the forefront of that, mm -hmm. so that automatically that was you know I was successful that way. Yeah. I mean, for myself, I started surfing in the late 70s, and pretty much every board I've ever ridden in my life was a Clark Foam Blank growing up. Why Why do you think you did so well? What was well, your skill that tuned you into what was going on? Okay, I started to answer that earlier, but it was the seasonal thing with the wetsuit thing, the six months on, six months off. People panicked, you know, when it was, when it was off. When I came, started making blanks, Right away, Foss and Walker made a terrible mistake. Is they, you can sell on quality, you can sell on service, and you can sell on credit. They went for credit and price. 
and I was broke and couldn't afford to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I didn't give credit. So you had to pay me. Yep. Which it turned out, you know, in 1968, when a lot of those guys went bankrupt, how much some of them owed Harold Walker was staggering, and mm-hmm. they all went bust on him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, the guys were were buying on credit and price, didn't buy from me because yeah. they weren't there, and and uh, that was that was a mistake they made. They shouldn't have made that mistake. Mm-hmm. They should have, you know, matched my price because during the season I couldn't have kept up. Yeah. Then what gradu- what gradually happened after that was I kept expanding. And they had all their money tied up, and guys like Dewey Weber and, and uh, Greg Knoll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, As- <laughs> and and uh, th- they had all their money tied up, and didn't expand. And then I started making improvements mm-hmm. and everything. And the easiest way to say it: within a very few years, I could make a blank and sell them a blank. And make a profit on it cheaper than they could make one themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so when you're in a position like that and you're charging more money, you have the money to expand. Yep. So, I did, and in 1963, I bought the place in Laguna Niguel, and and uh, in two buildings, end up with 25,000 square feet. Mm-hmm. So let's go back. Let's 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 backtrack right now. To the '60s, and and you want to talk about the transition, yeah, to the shortboard and all of that. Um, so what what happened was, is initially, as I said, the foam was heavy. Um, a, an interesting point for all the the California and Hawaii greenies is the uh, the original foam with that came out of the uh, Polytron Foss Walker thing for almost 10 years was blown with Freon. Hmm. Uh, Sweet and Hobie and I, we all used water blown so we could say we were green, which is, I'm, I'm not really a known green person, but uh, they were polluting the earth with their Freon. And uh, one very famous startup in uh, that came out with a green board years later, it was funny as could be that he didn't know what the foam he was using was blown with Freon too. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. And he was making these green claims and telling us what polluters we were. Anyway, so everything started improving. It ended up with about 10, 12 big manufacturers and they opened big factories and were making boards and-, and uh, Was GNS one of them? Gordon and Smith down in San Diego, uh, Jacobs, uh, Bing Copeland, yeah. Dewey Weber, those guys, mm-hmm. and, and you know they were big in advertising and Obi. Surfer magazine, and so the way they worked was they would have a a design, mm-hmm. and they were trying to you know I think with Don Hanson was trying to copy De- Detroit, you know, and come out with a new line every year. Mm-hmm. Hobie would start, have a new model this year, and. A new so and so and and uh, an endorsement or a you know whatever the the peck penetrator the oh you you name a bunch of bunch of different they have a name for the board yeah they'd advertise them they they could sell all they could make yep. in the summer yeah and they were selling on the east coast opened up endless summer blew the whole thing up I mean just completely when Bruce Brown came out with that. You, you can't believe what a kick in the rear it gave yeah, sales. 64, 65. Yeah. And uh, an interesting thing, he was my next door neighbor. Yeah, you were saying that. <laughs> you guys got into dirt bikes I mean, Yeah, I thought he was just screwing off. Yeah. And they, and they and bikes us over for the first showing. And it was one of the, probably the biggest shock of my life. Wow. To go over to his, your screw up neighbor's house that you played with forever and known, known he was. A little dinky punk showed up with a camera, begging for money, and uh, very successful up to then. And and uh, 
said he was going to take two years off to make a film. And he said, come on, well, you guys come over and show you my film, a small showing. And so you went over to your, your screw up next door neighbor's house and watched Gone with the Wind and The Godfather. And <laughs> oh my God, where did this come from? So when you watch it, did you immediately- Oh, I was in shock. Yeah. I mean- You could see that The Endless Summer was going to become The Endless well, Summer. Well, I, I mean, we had no idea of all that, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I mean, just- how did you come up with this? Right. You know? Yeah. And uh, and then that just rocketed the surfboard industry and surfing in general. Oh well. Oh my God. I went back east that summer, and every theater had it on in the whole East Coast, all over the United States. Yeah. It was one of the top box office sellers of the year, and was the first time a person had made a home movie, and knocked out the big Hollywood guys in sales. Yep. It was. It was. He was a, a, a pioneer in the movie industry, among other things, because no one had ever done anything like that before. Yeah. And but that that opened up the East Coast that has then had 150 million people within so many miles of the beach that they could go surfing. And oh my God, it was it was unbelievable. Mm. And that lasted through 1968. Mm -hmm. And then then it all then it all collapsed. But anyway, so there's the big manufacturers making the long boards, advertising and giving money to guys like Pesman here to to run magazines and stuff like that. And they were making a they're all getting rich off off the poor surfboard makers. Anyway, uh and so the the uh surfboard makers, they're coming out with these designs and the models and they're trying to copy Detroit and, mm -hmm. and do all these different things and they're all becoming big businessmen and things like that and what happened was so you're asking about the shapers if you were a shaper then you worked for someone like Hanson or Hobie or or Jacobs and they told you what to make okay and you shaped that then they had that surf contest the, the short board just going down in size started in Australia right and they saw the first ones, it's kind of a historic fact for some surf contest or something like that. And, and uh, 1966 World Championships in San Diego. Yeah, Matt something Young like won. that. And, and I remember the first guy that started ordering short blanks for me was Billy Castor. Okay. And that was in 1966. And so I was the only one that picked up on some of that. And I started making molds for him. Mm -hmm. Walker and Foss didn't. And so so that was the thing about, you know, knowing figuring out what's going on. Yeah, you were anticipating. I surfed, I saw what was happening. I had you know, some of some of my best friends have been some of the best surfers in the world. And so I was, you know, really in touch with that. And I don't know what happened to the other guys who were asleep. And the big board builders were asleep too. Mm -hmm. So what essentially happened was at that time, we pretty had a pretty high reject rate, and what do you mean reject? Reject the form that come out that had flaws and holes in okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, resin streaks, something wrong with it, you yep. know. So I had a lot of rejects, and I sold my rejects, you know, at different places, and then we'd sell them out of the shop too, because nobody wanted, you know, the big manufacturer didn't want to sell blanks, and they mm -hmm. didn't want. They wanted to control the thing and stuff like that. And, and so we we're selling rejects. And all of a sudden, you know, all these long haired hippie guys like Pesman looked like then, <laughs> weirdos start coming in buying these uh, rejects, you know, and it became a big business and uh, selling rejects. <laughs> and were the rejects going to be experimental shorter boards? Well, they were, making, they were making their own boards. There was a big. Yeah. There was a big kick in the late 60s. You had to make your own board. I see. Okay. And the reason you had to make your own board is they were figuring out that the boards the big manufacturers were making didn't surf as well yeah. under certain conditions as as other other things would. Yep. So we, we were talking a little bit a while ago about Phil Edwards and his surfing. Yeah. And mentioning it. Phil did something that was he, he was the reason he was so good is he started so young, but then what Phil did is he stopped surfing easy places like Trestle and Malibu and stuff like that, 
and started surfing beach breaks. Mm -hmm. Well, naturally, it takes a lot higher skill level to ride um, Velsiland than it does San Onofre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, so he was getting even better than everybody right. because of the waves he was riding. Yeah. But did the shorter boards... So he kind of disappeared from sight. And it was kind of funny because when he would appear... Every, everybody was just in in shock. Yeah, you know, in tears. Yeah, as I would imagine it, um, the shorter boards was kind of open up new breaks, so the well, beach the, breaks would be of, fun. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, open up a whole new thing. But well, what happened was, is during that period, it was kind of a build your own board thing, and I don't know exactly what that was about, but, and then I figured out later. After 1968, our sales fell off a cliff. Hmm. They went down to a third what they were in 1968 by 1970. But most people thought surfing had died. Mm -hmm. And the big manufacturers all quit. They thought it was dead or they quit or went broke. But that was the short board thing. But the short board thing was taken over by a whole new generation of shapers who didn't work for the big factories. Okay. Also, when there was the big slowdown in 1968, these big manufacturers had huge staffs of shapers and glassers and stuff like that. And a lot of them got laid off by the big manufacturers in the shortboard thing. So they went home in their garage and started building boards. And so we got a whole new group of board builders. Yeah. More or less a garage or undercover thing like that. Right. The way I put it is the shapers got control back. Yeah. They didn't have control when they were working for Hobie. You made what Hobie said to make. Yep. All of a sudden, they're in their garage, and they're making boards for individual customers again. Yeah. And it's, it's the old hand-shaped, yep. this, that, and everything. And then a whole bunch of people jumped into the shortboard thing. Yep. And that that... That changed everything, and nobody knew that was happening. Mm. Did you supply blanks to Dick Brewer, who was so important in that period? At one time during that period, 70% of the blanks I sold were plugs made by Dick Brewer. Okay. How's that? Wow. <laughs> and and were, were those plugs, they had more rocker, they were shorter, they were... Short boards, yeah. It was, it yeah. Was, he, was, he was following... The transition. Mm -hmm. So Brewer had a, a really good technical background and everything like that. And he could articulate what made a surfboard work. He was one of the first guys to make boards that would work at Pipeline and yeah. some of those yep. big wave boards and stuff like that. Guns. He did a lot, of the, a lot of the real important improvement work in that. Mm -hmm. um, Around the time of the shortboard revolution, you would have met Jerry Lopez, who you were telling me is one of your great friends. Well, when when Jerry Lopez came on the scene, Jerry was by far the most famous surfer in the world in his early twenties, and uh, I, I I met him with just barely twenty or something like that. Through a, he was uh, working with an older guy named Dave Rockland, mm -hmm. and so we became friends. And I would say. Jerry has helped me a great deal in the surf in the blank business. Yeah, and so one of the things he did was part of the shortboard revolution. Is he shaped a plug for me, and you've never seen anything like it. We had eight molds running twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. We couldn't make enough of hmm. of that plug. No one's ever done anything like that before. Right. And just to clarify for listeners, so the plug would be basically it would be the the sort of prototype that you would mold oh. mold off of. Oh, what what? Here's how that works. We start in foam. The original thought was you make everything out of a fiberglass mold, mm -hmm. and I figured out something that nobody else kind of figured out that you need a lot of a lot of molds mm -hmm. and the reason why do you need a lot of molds is there's all kinds of waves there's all kinds of skills and there are all kinds of riding the waves yeah so you can have a 
slow, short, mushy wave in Pensacola, or you can have Jaws. Mm -hmm. You need a different board for each one, kind of different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Radically different. Right. So you need different foam, different foam densities, different molds, different shapes, different everything like that. And different rockers as well. Yeah, rocker came late. Okay. That's another story. Okay. And our conversations yesterday, I told you too much. No, you're, we could go you're for too informed. We could go nine, Jamie, you've nine gotta, hours. You've got to <laughs> slow down and Take thing in chronological order. <laughs> we could go. This, this isn't an LSD session. We've got to we've got to make things a little logical. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's jump back to Jerry. You concur with that, Steve? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Steve, for backing me up. The LSD we can use as a little uh, as a chronological marker. We left off right around the LSD well, time. We won't talk about the. Uh, I, I got through that a period by not drinking, smoking, or using drugs. I know. I, I, I so anyway I have great respect for you with that. But so so Jerry. Lopez being a big figure in your well, life. But, but not only that, when you have a really good surfer like that, yeah, especially one that's really smart like Jerry, and and you torture them and interrogate them and everything, you find out an awful lot about what's going to happen or what's happening or what everybody's thinking about or yep. what everybody's doing. Yep. So if I didn't do that. I would be stuck with an old uh, ten foot uh, copy of uh, a Kevlin longboard, you yeah. know. Yep. And that's all I would have made. Yeah. But I had to. I had to try and figure out which way the the wind was going to blow, and and follow that. And to do that, you know, and and how to service the shapers and what yeah. they needed, and how to deal with them. I had to talk to a lot of people, and figure out a lot of stuff. It got. It actually got harder as the years went on. But but let me ask you this. Did that, for you, did it feel like work or did it just feel like the thing you cared about most in the world? I mean, I, in terms well, of that kind of follow your passion You want thing. to talk about work? That's another story. But I think so, what, what I'm but, getting at is... Well, you, these we'll, were we'll your... talk about work for a second. <laughs> I started in the surfboard industry so I could go surfing all the time. Yes, yep. I was known among my, you know... I had the nickname Grubby for a long time. For a, It was given to me by a guy in college because I used to go down and sleep in my car on the weekends and surf when I was going to school. I was kind of, would be considered a screw-up when I was young. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, all I really wanted to do was surf and play around and, and uh, do various things. So I've kind of been a little different that way all my life. But I did learn business, and you know, you eventually figure out, as you figured out, you have to have a job, and so you might as well. When you you've got to spend eight hours there, you might as well be doing something that keeps you interested, and and so yeah, that's kind of what kept me going. Yeah, and if I learned business management, and I learned some other, you know, things, accounting and different stuff like that, I could, uh, which was interesting to me to learn, I could uh, decide whether I wanted to sleep in in the morning or go surfing or go do something else or go to work. Yeah. And so I would kind of say I was probably too unstable to get a regular job. Mm -hmm. And so this fit in really nice for me. Yeah. That was how that all the work thing came to pass. Mm -hmm. What did you cater to them? How did you cater to each shaper specifically? What, what? Steve, when I, when I first started in business, I didn't know what I was doing. I was broke. I was, I was uh, young. I figured I, you know, I was going to have to figure out how I was going to make a living and all those other things. And I got really anxious and nervous, what you do in, in business. And it, it it just got worse and worse and worse and there was a, there was a lot of alcohol and it was going into drugs and it was going to this and that and after i started a blank business i got in a very bad marriage and i was having a tough time and then one of my mentors uh which was barney wilkes one of the founders of the san onofre surfing club an old 30 surfer and a dentist in San Clemente uh, died of alcoholism, so I quit drinking. And I started reading, and I finally figured out that uh, 
what my job was. And my job was to make these little pancakes and have them right and have them what they want and deliver them on time. And my customer's job was to make a decent order so we could understand it in a somewhat timely manner mm -hmm. and uh, pay their bill. And I decided that uh, I didn't have any money so the board builders can buy a blank and, and have it in the water in a week. And I didn't like a bunch of my foam that hadn't been paid for sitting out with a bunch of flaky surfers riding waves with it. So pretty simple business plan. Yeah. So, but what I really had to do is figure out what the shaper wanted and get it there to him right and in time and try and in time anticipate their need. Yep. In other words, uh, do that. And that was my job. It's so interesting. So it's a, it's a real simple job. Yeah. Once you, once you boil it down to that and take all the uh, hoopla around it, it makes it pretty easy. Yep. It's interesting because as a, as a former competitive surfer, I had a long relationship with Al Merrick. And it was so, I, I really cherished the memories of being in the shaping room with him. This was pre-machine and watching him, you know, carve out a surfboard right in front of me and I'd get blasted in foam dust. And watching that in that dialogue was always so fun because, you know, so many of us surfers and the best guys at that period would have been uh, Tom Kern, Sean Thompson, Willie Morris. They were my teammates that would give the feedback. And it was kind of often very inarticulate, you know, oh, the board kind of does this well, what have you. But but Al could translate it into what that would mean in the in the shape of the board. And then I imagine he would be having conversations like that with you uh, about what, what needs there were. Well, uh, Al was, a, I, I, one time I told him he was some kind of a, a surfboard psychiatrist because he could figure out and communicate with these guys as to what they needed, the real good surfers, which is really important. Yeah. And that was my job too. Yeah. If you don't, if you're in the water and you think you're a really great surfer and somebody's got a better board than you do, they may be better than you. So you better be riding the best board if you want to be the best surfer. Yeah. For you, for that break, for that place, Absolutely. that time, that everything else. Yeah. It's such a so big component in being a great the, a the shaper surfer. in the shaper on some beach break in uh Delray Beach in Florida needs a different whole set of things than a shaper in on Maui at Hokipa or something like that. The shaper has to listen to the local surfers. Mm -hmm. So really the control of the shape is not by the shaper. Mm -hmm. It's by the good surfers. Yeah. Are the surfers buying the boards? They're the ones that are the ultimate designers. Yeah. And if you're you know, you were a competitive surfer. If you didn't have as good of equipment as the other guys, you were screwed. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was there yeah. were the, there were two tangibles. One was having the best board under your feet. The other was uh, being as, as physically fit as you could be. And the, then the big intangible was what the ocean was going to do during those 20 minutes or 15 minutes that you were in the heat, you know? But, okay. the, but boards was probably the one thing that you would just constantly be trying to make sure that you had maximized. Well, here's a great statement by the, one of the great big wave pioneers, Buzzy Trent, who in his old age said this, the modern surfers are in better shape, have better equipment, and they're better fed than we were. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what about when the computer came in to shape blanks? Well, you talked about early innovation in surfboards. A guy named Michel Berlon in France built the first shaping machine. It was using an old digital equipment computer. I flew over to look at it. He was a friend and a customer for years since the, since the late 60s. He was also the second guy to surf in France. <laughs> hmm. uh, he built one. He, was, he had a machine shop and was an engineer. And he got a programmer and they made one with the digital equipment. That shaping machine was essentially the same as the modern ones, same technology, same computer software theory. When he built it, it was just when Apple computer was moving out of a garage and Microsoft had barely started. Mm -hmm. 
and the IBM PC was just started, you know, just the former. So they were doing a shaping machine then. So the shaping machine technology is old computer technology. It's primarily dependent upon the cutting head and the speeding of the cutting head. And the cutting heads have improved over the years. But it's, and, and the shaping machines have gotten better. There's been a lot of work done on that. The shaping machine did three things. One good and two bad. The good thing is it improved the shapes for all boards that are done on them. Mm -hmm. No more mistakes. You uh, mentioned Almeric. You just buy an Almeric board and uh, you take it to one of the computer things and have them copy it and make a blank, make a board for you just like the Almeric board. So everybody has everybody else's shape. So I can start a surfboard shop right now and have maybe not the latest, greatest, but pretty close to shape. Mm -hmm. A good shaper now, or a good surfer now, can learn how to use the machine and make his own shapes. So it's gotten to, you know, that's that, all that stuff is good for the writing of the boards. The bad things, there's a number of them. Uh, one is I can take the latest shape by the best shaper in the United States, send it to uh, China on the internet, and uh, the next container back can have that shape in a board sold at uh, Walmart, mm -hmm. if Walmart sells surfboards. So there goes that. Yeah. And that took out a whole bunch of stuff in the design industry. Is uh, Now it's a copy industry. So Pesman, if he was starting today, could be caught up with the latest, greatest designs with his first boards instead of being a punk that shaped, you know, really bad looking boards and stuff. So anyway, so that that part of the thing has helped the end consumer with better boards to surf with. You don't need, a lot of the early shaping machines really pissed me off because they start buying oversized blanks. Mm -hmm. So one of the things with urethane foam is the outside surface of your mold is cold and gravity makes the, the foam on the bottom higher density. Okay. So that gives you a, 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 a blank. You always mold them deck down. If you mold them deck up, you people would be going through their decks a lot more. Yeah. yeah. So the decks are always stronger on a foam board mm -hmm. than a the bottom. The outer surface is always stronger than the other stuff. The early sweet and and Dave Sweet boards, they call it hard shell technology and yeah. They were stronger, yeah. you know, because of that. So as we improved and got more molds in our molding technology and started going lighter in foam, we became dependent a lot more on close tolerance blanks mm -hmm. to keep the strength up. So we were taking advantage of that density gradient. So when the shaping machines came around, some of them were pretty kind. It's, they have to jig the blank into the machine so it fits where the computer doesn't know where the blank is. So they have to fit it so they're not running their machine head over through air and ruining the blank. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the operators started buying oversized blanks. And, and the shape that they're machining has to match the volume in the blank. Well, the, the shape has to be smaller than the blank at that point in the blank. Right. So a lot of them indexed their blanks in wrong. There was a guy in Hawaii who was taking a half and three quarters of an inch off the deck, getting in the softener foam. So what you did is you lost that with polyurethane foam. You lost that advantage. Yeah. And uh, a guy named Pat Rawson in Hawaii figured it out, not me, but he figured out we'd, we'd improve, improved our molding our, the way we made molds improved over the years, and finally we had some, a really good system that was really accurate. And we'd also improved the paper mold release a lot. And this guy Pat Rawson said, "Hey, you can make your blanks closer to shape." So we started making what was called in the industry the close shape blank, a blank very close to 
to the final shape of the board, which gave us a boost in strength because we weren't shaping so much foam off to yeah. make it. Yeah. So the shaping machines in different degrees took that away. Mm -hmm. So you lost some strength. Yeah. That was a bad deal yeah. for surfing. Yeah. Real bad deal. That was a negative. And now some of the blank makers I've noticed in polyurethanes and looking in their catalogs have used blanks. Their blanks are not for hand shapers, they're for machine shapers. Oversize. Mm -hmm. So that in turn costs more money. Mm -hmm. So that that was a loss. The other was a gain. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not, I don't know which is best or which is different. Uh one of these days everybody's gonna be shocked because there's enough technology out there that some real smart, well-educated group or team is going to blow everybody away. Yep. Unfortunately, that's probably going to come from Asia now. Yeah. But anyway, too bad. Right. Thinking about when you, though, that kind of beautiful period when surfing had yet to become as big as it is today. When you think about those early days compared to what it's become, did you, A, ever imagine it would become that? And B, what do you think of what it's become? When I started surfing, you almost knew everybody around that surfed. I used to very often surf trestle by myself with no one on the beach. Wow. And usually there would be maybe five people out or something like that. So how do I feel if I pull up a video on YouTube and see something on trestle and see all those people there? You can almost walk from board to board without touching the water. It's a different deal. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's changed. I'm yeah. not sure. But well, I remember yeah, I remember different times going down to Mexico and Phil Edwards and I going down to K thirty eight or something and discovering it. Nobody knew it was there and surfing it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And those type of things. And those days are still around different places on the world. Yeah. But other places it's gotten real crowded and it's got real commercial and it's got so I don't know what it, I I have no I, I I don't know how they feel about it now. Yep. But I know that the, the experience that I was building blanks for, that experience is still there. Mm -hmm. But is it there when you see uh, that many people in the water and it's real crowded? I don't know. Yep, yep, yep. What made you walk away? It was 2005. It's a three-letter word. Age. Yeah. You're not trying to run the nose when you're 90 years old. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're not doing a lake takeoff at 90. I really respect guys like Mickey Minos and Jerry Lopez that are still going strong on it. I don't know whether my body would have held up that long because I've had three spinal fusions. Mm -hmm. But the thing that stopped me is I was doing too many other things and I wasn't staying it. You have to keep surfing all the time to do it. Get out of shape, don't surf for two months and then go and try and, and uh, ride an overhead heartbreaking wave and the next to last time I went out that's what I did and it didn't work very well yeah I got really wiped out yeah <laughs> and I'm huffing and puffing trying to get a breath of air and going, oh my god what am I doing right and what made you close up shop with Clark Bohm at the end in the latter years I was spending over half my working time fighting the government my first big battle came in 83 well, going back further, in 1970, what was OSHA then, it was California, something or other, wrote me up as a model plant on how to handle polyurethanes. And I was in a statewide publication in 1970. In 1983, appeared the inspector from hell. Gave me a 30-day notice to close down. Lied to me. And, and redesigned a plant for me and how the plant should be designed. And it was all over uh, worker protection and fumes and stuff like that. Panicked. We had to close the plant down for some days, spend a whole bunch of money, hire a bunch of engineers, do it not the way that the OSHA inspector said to do it. Found out by calling Sacramento that I could get a variance. 
I applied for an emergency variance, got one, went to a hearing with seven guys, like a court hearing. And the last question was, what was going to happen if we don't give you this variance? And I said, we can moving the plant out of the United States. So they gave me the variance. Before me and after me getting variances was the fire department. So they couldn't pass OSHA either. And so anyway, so from then on out, I used OSHA a lot and they were great. You know, mm -hmm. they, they did a good job. They were real tough and regulatory and everything like that. In 1993, the Orange County Fire Authority had incorporated a whole bunch of small fire departments and they were very powerful. One of the biggest fire departments in the United States sent in the inspector from hell. From there, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. They kept coming back in the same things. They turned me into all these other agencies. We had all these different agencies citing me. The fire department would come down, they'd bring down the health department, the health department would say, okay, and the fire department would get pissed off and go get to another agency and they'd bring this and bring that. And just kept going and going and going and just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And then they, they brought in the EPA. My workers' comp insurance went from $6,000 a month to $55,000 a month. And it was just a general tightening of the screws. And I, I don't want to be harsh on all the people that work for the government. There's some people that work for the government and, and agencies like that that are excellent and trying hard and trying to do a good job. Unfortunately, they pay too much money in California, way too much. And they won't clean out the junk. Mm -hmm. So you have a tremendous amount of really incompetent people doing these overpaid, incompetent people doing these regulations. And they get promotions by writing citations. So you'd have a guy come down and you'd show him something and they'd go back and write a, a citation for something that wasn't true. Yeah. So then you have to fight that. Yeah. And just going on and on and on. And then finally they brought in the federal, the fire department turned me into the EPA. And the EPA is something that's frightening. And a friend of mine in, in Hawaii had just gotten a $4 million fine from him. And I looked at the whole thing and my future at that factory, at that location with that fire department at 72 years old was going to be, I was going to be working for some lawyer. Yeah from then on out, and so I closed it. Yeah. Um, so now you're up here on the ranch in Oregon. What, what are your, what's a typical day like for you? I was 72 years old when I closed Clark Foam, okay? To put that all in perspective, I'm now 90 years old. So I have a, a ranch and, a, and some farmland, and I do that, I enjoy it. It's a continuation of the blank business in a sense. I'm in agriculture. It's a very interesting to me. It's a whole new, it's a, it's a whole new field. Mm -hmm. I call it my second life. Yeah. So I got into agriculture when I was old and I enjoy it and I highly respect it. And it's really hard, a lot harder than I thought it was. And, uh, if I knew how hard it was, I probably would have choked out earlier. But uh, I enjoy it. It's fun. So what I do, I get up during the day and I'm a rancher. Nice. <laughs> not really. I, As I told the locals, I own a farm and I own a ranch, but I'm not a rancher and a farmer. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, um, anything that we've left out? Any any last words? Can I talk about Pesman for a while? Yeah, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Um, th thank you for that. It was a fun conversation. <laughs> Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our theme song is Give Me A Wave by Asuka Matsumiya and Paz Lenchanton. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, and Yeti. The journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. Thank you so much for listening to Soundings. 
We appreciate you. And until next time.